Hi there. I'm Michelle Cobb. I'm publisher of Audiophile Magazine, and I'm super excited to be here with you today. We're going to talk live with narrators about new and anticipated spring audiobooks. You'll notice that there is a Q&A box. Uh, if you would like to ask a question to any of our narrators, please throw it in the Q&A box, not the chat box, so that we do see it. All right, it's my job to get started today and introduce our guest. However, I do want to tell you, you want to be sure to stick around until the end. At the very end, we will be doing a giveaway. We've partnered today with Libro FM, and four winners will receive an email with some extra special goodies from them. Additionally, I've got a code and link for the chat box. And once we get started, I'll put that in the chat box. And even if you don't win, you can access a free audiobook through that link. All right, so let's get going here. I'm going to introduce our narrators. First up, we have Sunila Nankani, who's a classically trained actor with over 300 titles in many different genres, including young adult fantasy, rom-com, and mystery. She's garnered 17 earphones awards from Audiophile, and she was awarded Audiophile's Golden Voice Lifetime Achievement Honor in 2021. Plus, she's an audiobook narrator and a proud mom. And she'll be talking today about the Run, Rose, Run. Next up, we have Arthur Moray. He is also an audiophile golden voice. What are we doing? Having all these fantastic golden voices on. He's recorded over 400 audiobooks and directed 50 more. So you can see a lot of our narrators are also directing these days. He has also written screenplays and lyrics for Paramount, ABC TV, Harry bon Belafonte, and others, multi talented. He actually wrote and performed in theaters and cabarets around the world and is an award winning teacher, author, and editor. And he was managing editor for a trade publishing house in Los Angeles when he started recording audiobooks. Look at him go now. And next up, we have Bonnie Turpin, also based in LA. She is an actress, narrator, and activist who has narrated over 360 audiobooks. So you can see we're all newbies here today. Uh, she has narrated two Odyssey award-winning titles, is also a golden voice, and has won several Audi awards, including two for Best Female Narrator and two for Audiobook of the Year. So as you can see, she just sits around doing nothing and not performing well. She is an ensemble member of Cornerstone Theatre Company and is the founder of Sola, Sola Food Corp not corporation, co-op, an organization seeking to improve healthy food access in South Los Angeles. And now we get to see why I don't narrate audiobooks. And finally, we've got Julia Whalen. She's an actor, writer, and narrator of over 500 audiobooks. She has also won numerous earphones awards and is an audiophile golden voice. I swear we did not say that we were not going to have someone who wasn't, but it just happened that you all are. And she is the recipient of multiple Audis, including the 2019 Best Female Narrator Audi. And she received a Sovas for her performance of her own internationally best-selling novel, My Oxford Year. Her next novel, Thank You for Listening, will be published by HarperCollins on August 2nd. All right, that is enough of me. Just to remind you, we are taping this. You can view this next week on Audiophile's YouTube channel. And you could win all four of these audiobooks, as I say. Stick around to the very, very end, and you might get picked to be a random winner. Excellent. All right, here we go. I'm going to bring everyone on screen now, and I'm going to kick us off by turning it over to Sunila. Sunila is going to read from, for us from Run, Rose, Run by James Patterson and Dolly Partner. And then we will ask her some questions and offer you the opportunity to ask some questions. Remember, put those in the Q&A box, not the chat box. All right, Sunila, the floor is yours. Thank you, Michelle. It's really fun to be here with all of you. Um, and I will go ahead and read. If she had one wish, besides to get the hell out of Texas, it was that whoever bought Maybell would take good care of her. 
The distant lights of downtown Houston seemed to blur as Annie Lee blinked raindrops from her eyes. If she thought about her life back there for more than an instant, she'd probably stop wishing for a ride and just start running. By now, the rain was falling harder than she'd seen it in years, as if God had drawn up all the water in Buffalo Bayou just so he could pour it back down on her head. She was shivering. Her stomach ached with hunger. And suddenly she felt so lost and furious she could cry. She had nothing and nobody. She was broke and alone, and night was coming on. But there was that melody again. It was almost as if she could hear it inside the rain. All right, she thought. I don't have nothing. I have music. And so she didn't cry. She sang instead. Will I make it? Maybe so. Closing her eyes, she could imagine herself on a stage somewhere, singing for a rapt audience. Will I give up? Oh, no. She could feel the invisible crowd holding its breath. I'll be fighting till I'm six feet underground. Thank you. Now, there's something special about this audiobook in particular because it was actually read by a full cast. So it was read by Dolly Parton, Kelsey Ballerini, you, James Fooey, Emily Wu Zeller, and a bunch of other people. What do you enjoy about working on a full cast audiobook like this one? And I'm very curious, what are some of the challenges? Um, yeah, I mean, I love working on full cast audiobooks. I, I came up in the theater and I, I feel like this is this, the narration work that's closest to that because you really get um, to focus on one character or a couple of characters and really dig in um, more closely with a director. Um, and, and I love collaborating with, with other storytellers. That's really fun. I, it's, it's been challenging lately because we cannot all be in the studio together. So like relying very heavily on the director and imagination to sort of um, um, to be imagining what the other um, narrators are bringing to the role and, and trying to create a world together when we're in separate spaces. Um, and, and this piece also, in this piece, I was doing the narration um, for the whole book. So it was slightly different in that I was really thinking about um, uh, being a scaffolding for the other performer performances. Um, so that was sort of an interesting challenge to be to be doing on my own as well. But um, but really fun to work with. I mean, the cast is amazing. So really fun to be on an audiobook with with all of them. Bonnie, what about you? Have you ever worked with a full cast or ensemble, especially like with a big name star that, you know, maybe has a, a little <laughs> bit of a different timber? Um, well, like Sunila mentioned, we're not necessarily in the studio together. So it's, you know, basically you're just reading your part most of the time. It's not like a cast read. And sometimes that happens but it's very rare these days. Um, I am a little bit greedy. I tend to think at first, why aren't I reading the whole book? <laughs> <laughs> but I think the end results are, are great. Like, you know, with Opal and Nev, I mean, I couldn't have read all those different characters and made it come out the way that it did. It was, it was awesome to hear these specific different voices and everything. But yeah, I, there's part of me that wants to play every role. So, <laughs> well, I certainly hope for all of you that someday you can get back in the studio and, you know, being around the microphone together. Julia, yeah. have you ever had an experience where you've actually been in the studio with other actors that way? Um, yeah, I've done a, I've done a couple, not as much as I want to. Um, but yeah, I think usually we have the experience of everyone just has their particular chapter or section or like we've or even when it is intermingled, we've, it's just been cobbled together in editing. So it's, it can be a very like distant uh, situation, but I've done a couple of, uh, I think Lauren Blakely titled, Andy Arndt and I got to get, got to be together sitting across a desk, um, reading together like once and it was so amazing. <laughs> so I want more, I want more. 
Well, I wish for you all to have this great experience. Uh, LA Theater Works, you know, performs live in front of an audience and the actors actually rehearse. It's really fun. What about you, Arthur? Any experiences that you've been able to be in the booth with someone? Oh, you're still muted. Am I unmuted? You're there. Perfect, great. perfect. I've been in the studio uh, with um, one famous person. Anyway, I did a, um, a Carl Sagan book, of all things, with LeVar Burton. And um, he's great. But working with him, I suspect this is true with other uh, celebrity readers. Uh, he just doesn't prepare the same way we do. He's, right. uh, he kind of reads cold but he's really good at it. I mean, reading Carl Sagan cold is kind of a stunt because there's a lot of science in there, but he pulled it off and he was uh, just a very a extremely uh, personable fellow. It was great. So we have a great question from the audience. You know, if you're not together, do you actually plan, you know, from each other's studios, how you're going to interact and what the characters sound like? Sunila, um not usually uh, that's why i was saying um i think it's it's really helpful for these types of books to have a, a a good director um for this book in in particular um the director was a narrator which was helpful um and and also had done a lot of the recording uh, had recorded with a lot of the other actors beforehand so he was just doing he was giving me um he was helping me understand what was what other choices had been made um and that's yeah that's that's the way we did it yeah interesting so um arthur you talked about how you prepare so here's a good question in terms of pacing your narration in a work of fiction are the paces that you're going to use is that something that you is instinctual or do you work it out when you prep the book um, I don't make, pardon me, <clears throat> I don't make too many marginal notes because my handwriting is terrible and I um, can't read them as I go. But I do make little marks about uh, pacing is exactly what I'm interested in. Usually it's uh, uh, you speed up, you slow down, you give something a little bit more weight. Often those are the most important things you can do to uh, characterize somebody even more than a, a, a funny or interesting voice or an impersonation. I think pace is real important. I think you can hear it. And um, sometimes you're a little bit more melodic with a different person. I don't, I don't mark it a lot. I often remember it, uh, but it, it's a good question. It's important to do somehow or other, however you do it. I, I put make lists of people I know who talk at a certain rate <clears throat> and I assign them to various characters in the book, so. So Bonnie, I'm curious, uh, one of the audience members wants to know, is it harder to read a book alone where you're the only one doing all the voices or when you've got different people, um, you know, reading chapters or reading the different parts? Um, I don't know if it's harder. I'm going to do what I do regardless. You just have less to do <laughs> <laughs> when you're not the only voice, you know? So, yeah, it's. What's hard is when you get like five guys in a room in a book that I have to voice, you know, and you have to make all these men whose voices are lower sound different from each other. And that's where like pacing is really helpful. If some of them have a faster or slower rhythm, then that can help you not, you know, blow out your voice trying to do all these men, you know, <laughs> but I have a pretty good voice. So. And Never. do you do that in the booth? Like, you know, you sort of put your head down. Do you make some Probably. physical changes? Yeah. Probably. I find gesturing is very helpful sometimes. I don't know. So sometimes I'm in there like, you know, and I, I, or, or even a small gesture if I can't move too much. I don't, I don't know why it helps, but somehow it helps. And I've seen singers, like especially spiritual singers, you know, like pulling the energy and 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 moving it, like using their hands, and for some reason, it seems to have an effect in audio in in audio books as well. Ah, the secrets from behind the mic. <laughs> there we go. There's All another right. thing you can do, which is you, if you change the angle of your head toward the microphone, you get a little bit of a change. That's a that's a factor. 
That makes sense. That's why I wear this so that because I love to move my head and you would not hear a thing I said. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Arthur, we're going to move on to you. You're going to be reading from Sea of Tranquility by Emily St. John Mandel, which is read by John Lee, Dylan Moore, yourself, and Kirsten Potter. Any setup for the, the um, section you're going to read? Well, this is a this is a very complicated book. This is a a, um, a selection from a book written by somebody else. Um, Gaspari's sister, who is much smarter and more accomplished than he, but there's a very strong bond between them. <clears throat> Pardon me. Hands him the book to read to make a certain point. So there's a layer upon there's the layer of the fur the read the writer. There's uh, Gaspari, there's his sister, and the situation is very complicated. They're talking about um, time travel. So this is just a section that she says will connect him to the issue in different periods of time that she's studying. How complicated is that? It's complicated, but we're in your capable hands. Thank you. <laughs> we knew it was coming. We knew it was coming and we prepared accordingly, or at least that's what we told our children and ourselves in the decades that followed. We knew it was coming, but we didn't quite believe it. So we prepared in low key, in low key unobtrusive ways. Why do we have a whole shelf of canned fish? Willis asked his husband, who said something vague about emergency preparedness. Because of that ancient horror, too embarrassingly irrational to be anticipated aloud. If you say the name of the thing you fear, might you attract that thing's attention? This is difficult to admit, but in those early weeks, we were vague about our fears because saying the word pandemic might bend the pandemic toward us. We knew it was coming and we were breezy about it. We deflected the fear with careless bravado. On the day reports broke of a cluster in Vancouver, which was three days after the British Prime Minister announced that the initial outbreak in London was fully contained, Willis and Dove went to work as usual. Their sons, Isaac and Sam, went to school. And then they all met up for dinner at their favorite restaurant, which was crowded that night. Bit of a horror movie in retrospect. Imagine clouds of invisible pathogens drifting through the air floating from table to table, swirling in the wake of passing servers. Well, that's a bit of a horror movie, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so what's it like now, narrating an audiobook with a pandemic so central to the plot? You know, that's really a great question. I was thinking about it. When I first thought about this, I. So, oh yeah, I've read plenty of references to pandemics in the last six months or so, and I, uh, it's been touched on by some historians and, and po political writers and even a piece of fiction. And I went back to check it, and none of what I remembered or thought I remembered was there, or almost none. So I, be, I realized that if I'm living in pandemic times, if I'm living in a pandemic which affects everybody and every aspect of their work, um, I probably layer that into the, the story that I'm reading. And I'm, I'm not, I think that's actually kind of a bad thing in theory, although everybody who's listening to this book has had that same experience. I think there's maybe a difference between experiencing something like that and writing about it or reading about it. That makes the sense. actual. The actual difference is that in books, stories end and begin generally. And in life, uh, this pandemic just goes on and on and on. And, and the author makes a big point of, of connecting it to other pandemics and other times, all the way back to Roman times. So uh, I don't know if that answered the question, but I tried. I think it did. And I, I'll <laughs> turn next to Julia. Um, you know, how are you seeing the pandemic reflected in the books that you're being given to read these days? Um, I don't think I've, I haven't seen it yet in fiction. Um, I, but I record 
long form journalism for an app called Autumn. And so throughout the pandemic, my consistent, like every day getting in the booth to do an article or something about it. So I've, I've dealt with this pandemic in terms of how to perform an ever evolving um, set of facts and, and information. Um, but I have not, I don't think I've encountered it in fiction yet. Yeah. It's coming even to romance books, right? <laughs> yes. Uh, we have some great questions from the audience. So Sunila, I'm going to ask you about pronunciation of names in a multi-voice text. You know, how do you share them with the other narrators? How do you interact in that way to make sure everything is being pronounced the same? Oh yeah, that's really important. <laughs> I've definitely done multi-narrator books where we have pronounced words differently and gotten, you know, 400 corrections each. So that's a super important thing to do. Um, and yeah, so sometimes the, sometimes the publisher will facilitate that by having a list available for all of us. And, and sometimes it's just, you know, we've got a shared Dropbox and everyone's, you know, the person who recorded first is saying, this is how I pronounced everything. Um, but yeah, that's, that is really, really important to stay on top of for sure. So Bonnie, here's a question for you. Do you ever find that you get typecast to read particular kinds of books or characters more than others? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> In a word, yes. Um, unfortunately, the audiobook industry is not colorblind. And there have been a few, but few books that I've narrated that where the central character was not black, was not a black female, obviously. So I, I mean, I tend to read uh, black characters or characters or books that have to do with black people. And I do a lot of YA. I don't know if that's typecasting, but I, I do a lot of YA. It seems in the last year or two, I get a lot of mystical type of quantity of, of uh, content, um, like YA books where they're shape shifting and saving the world <laughs> and doing a lot of, you know, magical things, which I love. I love magic and woo woo and all that. So a little bit, yeah. A little tight, like I was like I was saying before we started, we were chatting, and I was saying I want to play more hillbillies, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I can do it. I can do that accent, but um, I don't get that many opportunities to do that. So uh, because those characters, that that particular accent is generally looked on as white, so they appear in some books that I do, but they're not the main character. And is there a, a book that you in particular wish you could have narrated? Girl, you don't want to get me started down that road. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> there are books that I have narrated that they then gave to another narrator. So, um, Really? Wow, I had no idea. Mm, yeah, we won't get into that, but... Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know of any off the top of my head that I was like, why they give that book to her? You know, I, I haven't felt that way. That's, it's been fine. <laughs> I well, get, good. I get plenty of great stuff to do. So I'm, I'm thrilled about a lot of the books that I have done. Excellent. <laughs> so Arthur, I'll ask you the hard question. Have you <laughs> ever narrated a book you didn't like, or do you usually kind of pre-screen to say, I'm, I'm unwilling to narrate that? <clears throat> Here's my worst story like that. I was okay. I was asked to read a book that was a sort of a spiritual book, a Christian book, and I I'm very careful about those because some some seem okay to me and some don't. But I got one that was by a, a an elderly Canadian pastor, and I glanced at it and thought this is okay, you know I'll be all right. I didn't really read it carefully enough because I was in a hurry. So then I started on it and I found a page a page a paragraph on a page that really was offensive i thought so i got in touch with the with the with the publisher and i said look you know um i promised to do this and i know you've got it on your schedule I, i'll do it 
but I want to use a pseudonym. Is that okay with you? And they said, oh, sure, that's okay if you use a pseudonym. You should be aware that all the publicity has gone out on this book and your name is on it. So uh, then my choice was either to do it under my name or to let somebody else read it under my name. Oh, wow. And that seemed highly risky to me. So I, um, I chose to do it myself. And I, when I got to the offending passage, I read it really badly. <laughs> Soft pedaled it, you know, tried to make it minimal. I'm not happy about that, but I don't know what I could have done. It sounds like you navigated a difficult situation in the best I way don't know. possible. I hope so. I hope so. Thank you. So Julia, you've read some of your own books. Um, do you have a favorite performance or novel that you've listened to or read? And also since you've done some of your own work, do you listen to your own work as well? Oh God, no, 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 <laughs> no, um, no. Uh, recording the first book was like the hardest thing I've ever done uh, because I couldn't turn off the editorial brain. Um, right. And then I don't know, I'm about to do it to myself again. Uh, but um, no, in terms of like, is there, do I have a favorite book that I've done? That the, wasn't one of you mine? Know, or it doesn't have to be yours, you know, a favorite yeah, no, performance. It definitely wasn't mine. <laughs> okay, yeah. A favorite listen. Um, <laughs> oh man, I don't know. I mean, at this, at this point, I feel like I've just, I'm, I'm very, very lucky where I feel like every book that I'm getting right now is something I would want to read myself as a reader um and it's something I've enjoyed performing so I I'm very I'm in a really I mean you know as we're going to talk about book lovers but I really feel like I enjoyed uh so much her last book People We Meet on Vacation and also Beach Read uh and I just I love those books and they were kind of like pandemic self-soothes for me being able to get in the booth with them it was good it's pandemic self soothes for a lot of us listening to our guys. <laughs> <laughs> Sunila, do you enjoy narrating works from different perspectives or life experience from your own? And, you know, what type of preparation do you do? Because that might be really challenging if you really have no experience um, with the characters or, or what they've done. Yeah, I, I mean, I would say I, I typically don't do books where I, the experience of the main character is just like way, way, like I can't relate to it at all. Um, no alien I, shapeshifters then? <laughs> well, actually, maybe I haven't. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, and, and I would say, I mean, I feel like it, it's kind of tough for me to, to even think of a book that's like, difficult where, where you can't relate at all um but yeah so I you know I I I do a lot of young adult now which is feeling farther and farther away from my experience but but I also just really enjoy sort of visiting that part of my life again um so yeah so I I, I usually I would say it always there's some point of um contact some point that feels like connected to me and i use yeah. that to to sort of break into it and um and uh sort of find the characters and tell the story excellent all right we're going to move on to our next reading bonnie um you're going to read from the memory librarian by janelle monet which was read by you and the author any setup that you can give us to the excerpt? I'll just say that all of the stories, this is a book of short stories, and all of the stories deal with a future world. I'll just say that. Excellent. We look <laughs> forward to hearing it. Um, oh, maybe I'll say a little more. In this particular story, part of this story, um, there, uh, there are female people living in a an intentional community. Put it that way, and they they're doing this so that they're safe because there's a lot of um, uh, I don't know tracking and controlling and 
you know, uh, telling people how they need to live by the authorities and stuff. So they're they're out in an intentional community that's away. It's a ways away, and it's kind of secret to the larger world. All right. Here we go. Excellent. Thank you. She liked to close her eyes when she stepped into the cave, although it wasn't necessary. When she spoke in the cave, the echo carried the deepest notes of her voice, the reverb filling the darkness as if she were on a stage. Jane let her head drop back as she hummed a melody from before the pink hotel or even New Dawn's capturing her. She let herself sway to the dripping water until she heard a shake and a snap and the blackness behind her eyelids turned red. She opened her eyes and shifted. Nier had pulled out a flashlight from their belt clip, resting it on a large piece of flatter stone. It lit up the onyx-swirled gray stone, not like a spotlight, but like a candle. An intimate performance. Same as usual, Nier asked. Jane nodded, slowly settling down into the dirt, kneeling. Nier took a breath, and then recited the opening. Tell me a story you don't want to forget. Jane pressed her hands against the rich soil. When she had first arrived at the hotel, she'd questioned the way that the cave was used. This rich dirt could have been moved into the sun to grow trees and vegetables. The pushback had been immediate. It was one of the earliest things that the women of the Pink Hotel taught her. This cave was growing things, was being used for growth. Because instead of tubers or flowers, memory found purchase here. I love that last line. So tell us, you know, you obviously read and the author read, what kind of preparation went into your work? What kind of interaction? And did you listen to her album as part of your process to prepare? I did not. And I didn't even know, are there titles in the book that are from titles of her songs? That I do not know. I did have a conversation with the author and um, I had complimented her on a phrase that's used in the book. And she told me it was from a song called The Power of Yet, which she had performed on Sesame Street. And so I was able to look that up on YouTube. I mean, I didn't, I did this after I read the book, but um, her, her book, it was very challenging because it is a future world and her imagination is quite incredible. <laughs> and um, in this future world, uh, you know, kind of the, the gender tolerance that we're learning now where we're asking people their pronouns and things like that, that that has become totally normal and people are all we all places on the spectrum of gender. So that's an interesting fact that's that's present in most of the stories and There's hopefulness in it also, which I love there's a, there's a hope that these children that are here now or that are that are present in the time of the book um, are going to put things in place to make the world better to to change the trajectory that we seem to be on now to something more heartening you know more more beautiful for the future did i answer your question i think i went off on a side trail there <laughs> no i think you got there which which leads me to another question um okay. you know and i'll i'll ask the the group here, you know, um, Bonnie's talking about a book in which you're sort of picturing a more evolved or more idealized world. Do you often see that you are reading things that where the world looks different and you, you get to sort of be and experience a part of that? Or is it all now? <laughs> oh, it's not all now for sure. And, and are we just talking about fiction or are we talking about yeah. Well, you know, fiction is more likely to be um, predicting a future which is very different than, than what we can think of. Well, just I narrated one book that I want to highly recommend. It is nonfiction and it's a multiple narrator read. I don't know how many of us there were, 
but I only read a few of the chapters. It's called Regeneration by Paul Hawkins. And it is about it changing, you know, the climate change trajectory in in 30 years, you know. So it, it was healing to just read that there are some solutions that could be put in place, you know, that, that we can work towards. So I highly recommend that one. Excellent. All right, we have many audience questions, so I'm going to try and get a few of these. Uh, Julia, how do you research on how to pronounce different names from other countries, cultures? Any tips you have for people there? Yeah, I have like a whole research protocol. Um, but so this is like way too, we, <laughs> this is a graduate <laughs> level seminar in that. Um, but uh, I, I think that, I mean, my, my one caution is that when you, if you're first starting out, and I don't know if this is coming from a narrator or, um, but you know, beware the bots. Um, a lot of the YouTube sourcing uh, is just a robot taking a taking a stab at it. Um, it should in no way be considered um, authoritative. My I have a kind of standard of being able to verify a pronunciation from two sources that I think are reliable, um, and so between Forvo and um, Uglish. Um, and then also, if it's a foreign word, being able to find the um, transliteration of the word and search for that, not just the anglicized spelling of it, will will make a difference. It will get you closer. Wow. Yeah. So sorry, that was. No, it sounds intense. Hard, I mean, horrible.com but... <laughs> <laughs> for those who don't know. Yeah. yeah. And I'm going to jump in on that. I think this happens to me a lot. Like, also sometimes with certain words it depends on like it's uh pronounced differently depending on which country or which part of the country uh it takes place in so it's also important to to track that yeah and there's a cultural sensitivity to that as well like we're seeing that right now and like even just in the last month the choices that have had to been to be made in if we're doing ukrainian uh place names maybe find, making sure we have the Ukrainian pronunciation, not the Russian pronunciation. Um, right. These choices can be politicized. So it's just coming to those um, decisions with a, an extra layer of sensitivity, I find helpful. The, the golden standard for me, the best way to get a, an author's name pronounced is to find a, um, a YouTube clip of an interview where the author is in the room with the interviewer then you have to assume that the interviewer got her, got it right because because she got it from the horse's mouth so to speak but but there, there are a lot of places on youtube you can go but there's also a lot of misinformation as, as julia says yeah searching through podcasts is helpful too because sometimes podcasts, yeah, podcasts will have people introduce their own name yeah all good Not tips to, yeah right. i'm i'm curious do any of you speak a foreign language that is helpful for you because no I, hear I, I do. <laughs> I, I speak some Hindi and I speak my my mom's dialect. Nobody nobody ever asks me to do this. <laughs> my mom's from Ghana, so I also speak her dialect called Chi. Um, but nobody ever asks me to do some Chi. All right, we're putting it out in the universe for you. There it is. I've there just, it is. I have just my... enough high school French to get me into trouble where people think I speak it and I don't. That's that's the problem. My uh, partner teaches Italian at ah. a college level and so i am now everybody's go-to source uh, on italian words and i just feed them to her and get her to read them into a phone and uh, I'm, I'm very i'm very popular because of this that is the thing you do learn other narrators who have that information like i that is i bother eduardo ballerini for italian all the time and uh we all we all kind of know the special skills that other people have <laughs> i didn't know arthur i could have used your help Next time, Bonnie. Yeah. You know where to go. A rare book where I had a black woman married to an Italian. <laughs> Probably a rare marriage. Too. She wasn't the main character, but there was Italian in it. <laughs> I love that sense of community that uh, audiobooks have that you you all can draw upon each other and you know help each other and guide each other in these choices that you're having to make and then all these accents and things that you're having to do because you get to play all the parts. <laughs> All right, we're going to head into, we have so many audience questions, but we're going to head into Julia's 
reading from Book Lovers by Emily Henry, and then we'll get back to some more audience questions. So Julia, set this up for us. Okay, so the setup here is I actually chose a section that has um, dialogue because it is a rom-com, and so you want the two people in conversation as much as possible. Um, things to know about this. So this this is, you know how in a Hallmark movie where like the city guy goes to the small town and like learns the meaning of life and there's always some like bitchy girlfriend at home, the city, the city girl who like is in love with her Peloton and um, is like high powered, you know, business suit um, who just like doesn't get him. Uh, this is her story. This is the Hallmark antagonist's story. So this girl um, ends up, Nora is her name, ends up uh, in a, a small town only to find there her big city foil, the guy that she kind of has a enemies to lovers thing with. And so they're stuck together in this small town, um, resisting all of the Hallmark tropes that are being thrown at them. So I should also preface this by saying that I had, I had texted with Emily and threw it up on Twitter, but he is delightful, um, this character. And so, uh, and he, but she, she makes him like impossibly sexy. And so just, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to win on that one, but okay. He tips his chin toward me. You tell me, Nora, do you think this place is interesting? It certainly, I search for the word, peaceful. He laughs, a husky, jagged sound, one that belongs in a crammed Brooklyn bar, the streetlights beyond the rain-streaked window tinting his golden skin reddish. Not here. Is that a question? He says. It's peaceful, I say more confidently. So you just don't like peaceful? He's smirking through his pout, smirting. You'd rather be somewhere loud and crowded, where just existing feels like a competition. I've always considered myself an introvert, but the truth is, I'm used to having people on all sides of me. You adapt to living life with a constant audience. It becomes comforting. Mom used to say she became a New Yorker the day she openly wept on the subway. She'd gotten cut in the final round of an audition, and an old lady across the train car had handed her a tissue without even looking up from her book. The way my mind keeps springing back to New York seems to prove his point. Once again, I'm unnerved by the feeling that Charlie Lastra sees right through my carefully pressed outermost layers. I'm perfectly happy with peace and quiet, I insist. Maybe. Charlie twists to grab his beer, the movement pressing his outside knee into mine just long enough for him to take another sip before he faces me again. Or maybe, Nora Stevens, I can read you like a book. I scoff, because you're so socially intelligent, because you're like me. Fantastic. So, you know, some fun stuff in there, also some emotional stuff in many romances. How do you wring out all of the emotions in a romance novel like this one? Oh, they're there. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there's, I don't think there's a, a lot to, to bring out. I think that my approach with um, rom-coms though specifically is that they're so often two-handers, like you're really dealing with these two characters in constant relation to each other. And so um, a lot of my approach actually becomes more like a director than an actor necessarily. Like I, I've, I try to really put these two characters in a scene together like as if it were as if I were staging it and imagining how they're interacting um that's kind of my approach to it and you know who doesn't love love they're fun they're they're incredibly fun to do um especially when there's banter and it's just it's quick and it's great and in fact fun fact little piece of trivia but um the very first Audi that I won was for a romance that Arthur Nair directed me in <laughs> my my so. biggest award <laughs> it was for Nora Roberts the witness which is still one of my favorite books ever and uh yeah we spent uh well we did that we did the book and then we had to turn around and do the abridgment we were in studio That's for right. a couple of weeks I think you can imagine Julie it's pretty hard to direct and, <laughs> and Bonnie too you just bring some magazines and crossword puzzles <laughs> and have a snack and <laughs> you just sit there and listen to them it's great but we had a really hard book. 
that was a hard book. Good Lord. It was, it was hard. It was, it wasn't exactly dull, but it was featureless sort of, I don't know. It, it was information. <laughs> it's about Roosevelt's uh, black cabinet, FDR. Yeah, don't black call cabinet. it Roosevelt. It's about the black cabinet. It's about the black cabinet. Yeah. Un during, yeah, coincidentally, during, during. In the spite of tenure. Roosevelt, <laughs> there was a black cabinet. Yeah. Well, Eleanor helped, but anyway, but you were brilliant. You were great. Oh, thanks. <laughs> so Arthur, I'll ask you as a director, you know, sometimes I would imagine you have to direct a sad scene. You know, do you and or the narrator ever have to, you know, stop and have those emotional moments, have a good cry? I see Bonnie nodding. I did a book. I directed a book with, uh, do we mention names? With Dominic Hoffman. It was about uh, a, uh, not a Tutsi, what's the other one? A, uh, a Hutu refugee in Congo going back and forth across the border, living in tent cities, living with uh, uh, parents who were in trouble, random massacres. Uh, I mean, just absolutely a horrible story by a, a very, very brave man. And we got near the end of it and Dominic just couldn't go on. And I couldn't go on. It was, we were both so like, choked up it was uh, impossible to continue for a few minutes so i think that's that's him doing his job really i thought it was incredible and and the book and the the, the moment was absolutely it deserving of that kind of response if that's the right word i know as i as a listener always appreciate it when i can hear that emotion in the the narrator's voice um, right but there's a fine line there's a there fine is. line between like actually being intelligible I mean, the, I, there's there's scenes that are maybe a page and a half, but it takes me an hour and a half because I've got to like stop, clear the voice, get through the, in fact, there was one book where I actually just gave up and I did all of the dialogue straight through. And then I went back after my voice had like cleared and I was done crying and dropped in the um, the prose in like the actual sentences, the narrative between the dialogue, because otherwise it was like, I couldn't have, I wanted to stay in it for the character's sake, but not you, it would have sounded so weird, so. I don't have the editing chops for that. Ah. <laughs> oh, it took me, it took Get me it. so long, Bonnie, and I don't recommend it. We're not, man, we're not meant it to be doing this. It won't happen over here, no, it won't happen. <laughs> But Bonnie, when you when you make a mistake, you know, what do you do? Do you just stop and start again or do you roll yeah, back? Yeah, I mean, most of the stuff that I'm having to self-record, they want punch and roll. And explain fact, to us what punch and roll is. Punch and roll means when you make a mistake, you stop and you go back and you put your cursor where the right before where the mistake was. And you usually have a little pre-roll set up so that when you start recording again, you'll hear the last three seconds of what you said before the mistake, and then you say it again and go on from there. So that's punch and roll, but some producers bless their hearts. I, I won't name names, but there's one who lets us free roll. And that means they take everything that happened while you were recording, whether you stopped and talked to the director and laughed and sneezed and cleared your throat and blow your nose and cried, all of that goes to the editor and they handle it. <laughs> well, we have some very talented editors in the audio yeah. publishing world to, uh, to make sure whichever way you record, it, it comes out sounding really, really nicely. All right, we have a, a great question and I'll put you on the spot, but I'll give you a second to think about this, all right? So I'm gonna ask everyone, do you have a dream author or book that you would love to narrate? And while we're thinking about that, Julia, I'm gonna ask you to tell us a little bit about your new novel. It's coming out August 2nd, I believe. And will you be narrating it? I will be narrating it for my sins. I will be. Um, I uh, it is set in the audiobook world. It's a very meta uh, book. It is about a an actress um, who, because of a tragic accident, it is doing uh, has been a narrator for about seven years now. And uh, she started out doing romance under an alias, but kind of got out of it as soon as she possibly could because she just doesn't believe in what romance sells. Um, but she gets like that one final, like one last heist 
kind of offer to do uh, one last romance um, with the most like enigmatic male narrator also performing under a pseudonym. Um, and so it's like a kind of send up of romance novels, a loving send up of romance novels um, and a glimpse into our weird little industry. So <laughs> there's, there's a good follow on question there. I'll, I'll ask Sunila this, you know, speaking of romance novels, what about steamy love scenes? How do you handle those? Um, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it, yeah, it's funny. Um, sorry, I just listening to Julia and I was like, oh, I know that. We have been starting in the starting in the romance and being like, how do I get out of this? Um, but then it's it, and so I feel like when I first started to do it, I was like, I'm just gonna read this as quickly as possible just to get through it. And now, now I'm like, you know, there's it's it's fun. It's fun, actually, <laughs> you know, to to it's part of the whole um, you know, when you're doing like I do a lot of rom-coms, um, it's when you're when you're playing the two characters i don't know you just get to this point where you're like you want them to do it you know so it's like really actually like yay you know when you get to that part and and i think you you just have to lean into it and and have fun with it otherwise I, I, I really think, I mean, Sunil is so right that like you get to th the point of a romance, right, is that all of the major character development scenes are done through the relationship is what is moving the story forward, as opposed, you know, in the same way that like a break in the case and a thriller or mystery would be the thing moving the, the story forward. So these scenes are like climax scenes but it's because they they're where the characters really reveal themselves and so there is something really satisfying and fun about that and i do i agree you just steer into it just steer ideally. into it give it the same yes right ideally <laughs> sure. sometimes sure. enough is enough you know yeah sometimes you got uh, i don't get these much anymore but i used to get a lot of urban type rom romances and I swear that these people would be having sex four times a day. I mean, that's not realistic. Come on. <laughs> All right, I'll stop being the romance apologist. Giant members. I mean, yeah. I I don't I don't care for those too tough. But yeah, sometimes they're, you know, actual love making or I mean, even even if it's a little graphic can be great, but there's there's too there's also too much sometimes. Well, I noticed, noticed that Arthur stayed out of that mix. So I will uh, start with him to say, all right, dream author book that you would love to read. Well, there, are, there aren't so many that haven't been read by somebody else. I mean, I would take uh, pretty much anything that gets sent to uh, Eduardo Bellarini. I'd pretty much anything he's got, I'd take happily. Um, there's a, a Brazilian author I really adore. Uh, Machado J. Assis, who is kind of magical realist. I like books where you start in one little place and there's a little aperture and you go from one world to another world. Um, Nathan Englander does that. Uh, J. Assis does that. Sometimes even a historian does that. Um, to End All Wars by um, Adam Hochschild. It starts out seeming to be a story of uh, the British during World War II one, which seemed very narrow to me, but within about 10 pages, you realize he's not just writing about Rudyard Kipling. He's writing about war in general. And it seems to me if you ground something like that and then make and then go to the more powerful thing. I mean, I think this book, uh, Sea of Tranquility does that. It starts in an odd little corner and then it broadens out to say something about history, uh, not just about uh, pandemic, but about uh, autocrats and uh, and uh, think you know um, racism I mean it doesn't specifically say that but you see that that's going in that direction so uh, did I answer that question three or four times you did and you you, you twisted it nicely away from romance um, <laughs> Sunila what about you do you have a, a dream author or book that's like the hardest question ever um I <clears throat> actually something Arthur said just reminded me like my first love in books is magical realism and so and I feel like you know Salman Rushdie you know Garcia Marquez Isabel Allende um I just love that sort of 
that sort of like dance between like the magic and the political um, and the sort of these like epic family stories. Um, Woo, I'm gonna have to go back and <laughs> find one of those to read. Um, yeah, so some something like that I think would be would be my dream. How about you, Bonnie? Well, I the first one that came to mind is a young author, and some of these authors have beef with each other. So I'm not gonna say the name of that author. I'm gonna say the one that I didn't get to do, that I wanted so badly to do. Um, which was Toni Morrison. Mm. She narrated all of her own fiction. I did finally get to do some of her essays and speeches, and that taught me a lot about her process. And that was why, you know, what made me like, really, I mean, I loved her books, but when I learned how long she took to choose the type of plant that was growing in front of the house that was mentioned in the first paragraph. I mean, I was like, wow, this woman is, is the gold standard. So I finally got to narrate a, a short story of hers called Recitatif. So that's coming out. And I just did a book about another author's relationship with her that was amazing and it's called miss chloe so look out for those we're getting some great recommendations here all right julia bringing us up to the the last question here okay so i used to my answer to this actually used to be jojo moyes and i just never thought i'd get to do one of her books because she always writes books set in england um and then she went and wrote the giver of stars and so suddenly like my dream author i got to i got to record i would love I mean, the, the rights are so complicated, but um, if they can ever make audiobooks of Salinger's work, I have to do Franny and Zoe, like mm -hmm. seminal yeah. text for me. It has to happen. Um, and yeah, but the, the, so that's really, that's that, that's like the final one, I think. All right, we're putting it out there in the Put universe for all of you to get those books that you want. All right, we're coming up to the end here and we have stuff to give away. <clears throat> so four people will win a copy of all of the titles from our partners on this, librofm.com. So I'm gonna ask each of you a very hard question. Pick a number between one and 86. Arthur, starting with you. Oh, gee, let me do this right, 37. Oh, okay. Julia. 15. Sunila. Nine. And Bonnie. 55. Okay. I will go into the back end and grab those numbers randomly from the, the list of, of uh, people that attended. So uh, hope someone out there enjoys the winnings. He'll be receiving an email from Libro FM. I'd like to thank all of you guys. You were just fantastic today. I have learned a lot and I thank you for, for sharing your thoughts and your dreams with us. That was a, a really nice way to end today. I'd like to thank the staff of Audiophile, all of you for coming here today. Uh, of course, the publishers who allowed us to do these excerpts and Libro FM for partnering with us on this. The recording will be available on the Audiophile YouTube channel by next week. And we hope you all have a fantastic day. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Michelle.